Hello, welcome to Nerds at Night. I'm Tolly. And I'm non-lethal. And tonight we'll be taking a little bit of a break from talking about games. We're going to go back to technology. What are we talking about tonight, non-lethal? Uh, it's going to be sort of a broad category, so we may sort of rant and meander around a bit, but we're basically talking about the development of technology and the acquisition of technology by what we are sort of penciling in calling mega corporations. So you things like Google, Facebook, Amazon, etc., who are like hoovering up all the other companies and doing some weird things. That's right. I'm, I'll am i just fess up right now. The reason that we're discussing this is because I noticed in the news the other day that Google bought Twitch, and my immediate reaction to that unlike the Facebook acquisition of Oculus Rift, was this is why we can't have nice things, because I'm just now assuming that anything that gets bought up by a large company will immediately just be destroyed by that company. Yeah, it's not a completely unfair stance to have, and like with the Twitch acquisition, the reason why I'm a bit touchy about it is because Twitch was sort of one of those alternatives to YouTube, especially for gaming and game streaming, and now it's all owned by the one company. Yeah, it definitely felt before, at least in the case of Twitch, that it was it was sort of almost an indie community. I mean, I know it's huge and heaps of people are using it, but it still felt very indie because Twitch still felt like a bit of a startup, and I'm I'm sure they were uh, probably having revenue problems because I have no idea how they're monetizing the site. They're certainly not filled with ads like friggin' YouTube is, but it's it's just a bit of a shame to see this sort of almost going corporate and how. Google may have to try and monetize Twitch to keep it viable in a business sense. Well, that is the one concern that they will have to monetize it or put more ads on or whatever it is. But that's sort of the devil's advocate, I suppose. It could be that they're just buying it up because it's become popular and they just want to grab the user base, basically. And maybe they'll integrate it into Google+. Plus. <laughs> Sorry, I just kind of choked a little bit. <laughs> Yeah, that's always the uh, the concern is, I mean, a lot of these bigger companies have their own agendas and they want to integrate what they buy to help push their other services. And this is the fear that a lot of people had when Facebook did buy the Oculus Rift. It's like, oh, now I'm going to have to, you know, check my status using Oculus Rift or, you know, I'm not going to be able to, I'll have to log into Oculus Rift using my bloody Facebook account or whatever. And you and I briefly discussed this i'm pretty sure and our opinion was that it's it's not really that much of a bad thing and it's it's mildly possible that this may be the case with google buying twitch but i'm just not that optimistic yeah well i've got a few friends who use twitch and i'm sure they won't stop using it because of this acquisition unless there's some sort of dramatic overhaul in the system that's fair i i think the the other problem you can have is these companies start to build monopolies with things like this. I read briefly in the news a short time ago that Google was using its market position to help sort of strong arm some labels into giving Google a better deal on different services. So it was maybe giving them a bit of a harder time on YouTube to make sure that they'd sign up to Google Music with a with a favorable, favorable deal for Google, which is, is some of the things that I have concerns about with this acquisition of Twitch. It's like, Google are a business and while they probably have the capacity to just keep Twitch as an indie thing and ad free and and just set up for the community in reality they're really probably going to have to run it like a business and that may mean some changes for people who are using it um under its current guise really yeah like and Google as you sort of read in the news are it appears on the surface they're trying to do some like good things like with bringing Wi-Fi to the furthest reaches of the world and things like that so everyone can get on the internet. But um, or maybe that was Facebook, uh, one of the two. But it, also they are a business at the end of the day and their business is there to make money. So whether they're going to do it with keep Twitch pure, as you said, just sort of to get public favour and to keep their position with the public sort of clean as opposed to monetizing it and turning into just another revenue-raising machine. You raise a couple of good points there. The first one is, um, you're right on two ways, that both Google and Facebook are trying to bring the internet to the furthest reaches of the world. I think Google may have better intentions. It certainly feels like in the case of Facebook doing it, Zuckerberg feels like I want to expand my user base and control more people, more ha-ha. Whereas Google is trying to use it to deliver medical services to the further reaches of the third world and things like that through this Project Loon. It's it's 
just to give an overview of the project of anyone that hasn't heard it's the most absurd thing but it's it's crazy that it works um google have essentially got these these weather balloons that float up fairly high in the sky like higher than what planes would typically fly and things like that and they literally just float around and between a group of them they essentially create almost like a, a mobile phone network or a wi-fi network it's a bit of a combination of the two and essentially create an internet coverage radius based on where those balloons are positioned and they they just float around and they essentially just provide wireless internet in the middle of nowhere through satellite relays and things like that and it, it's it's literally just a freaking balloon giving you the internet it's a pretty cool concept and i do applaud the effort they're doing for this like as as you said it's, it seems to be for medical purposes and everything at the moment and on the surface it doesn't look like there's any sort of profit to be had to providing free internet to these areas that don't have it otherwise and it's good publicity and it's a good service and yeah it's interesting it'll be interesting to see where they go with it yeah it's it's definitely something that i think is is starting to change in the world that um internet is becoming a bit more of a human right more than a luxury but just to to backtrack a bit just so we can muddle things up a bit more the other the other good point you raised around google being a business and monetization we have to give them some credit in the sense that they they monetize well with youtube they had to monetize obviously if if the thing wasn't making any money the the server costs would probably be crushing them by now but they managed to monetize it just with ads now we all hate ads but you can get around it with ad blocker and things like that and i'm not advocating ad blocker for anyone out there who runs a website based on ads going oh you son of a bitch but monetizing with ads is a lot better than what they could have done in terms of they could have said if you want to upload a video over 10 minutes you're going to have to subscribe for 99 dollars a year to have a premium youtube channel account and they could have really split people up by charging people but all they're doing is asking you to sit through a 30 second ad yeah that's right and a lot of a few of the videos that i watch um have their ads purposefully at the end of the video so it doesn't it minimizes the impact to the people watching the video so the ads still happen and they still make their money from the ads and so do google slash youtube but it, the end user the person watching the video like me doesn't get impacted by watching this ad I didn't know they could do that. That's really polite. Yeah, it's quite nice. Those courteous bastards. Yeah, very nice of them. Anyway, we'll casually segue into another piece of technology that was in the news some time ago, but we're going to cover it now because screw you, we do what we want, is Amazon and a few other companies are looking into using drones. Now, if you haven't heard of what a drone is, you're on the wrong podcast, so just click stop and delete the file, please. Are you done? Okay, thanks. Okay, for, for everyone else, um, the, the use of these, these drones, these remote-controlled helicopters in some of them, autonomously controlled helicopters, the potential with them is amazing. But Amazon is looking into, and I'm, I'm sure this is at a very high level, looking, looking into delivering packages using them. Yeah, it's an interesting concept. Like, it would be really hard to see. Like, I just can't picture in my mind how it could be so accurate uh, with their GPS and traveling around and like, is it just going to go to like the address and drop it on like what it sees as the front yard with a video camera? Is it going to be someone controlling that or is it just going to drop it at the location or is it going to like set off an alarm and you have to come and grab it off it? Are there going to be kids throwing stones at these things whenever they're flying overhead, which will absolutely happen. Like it's a great idea, but I'm finding my heart, finding it hard, sorry, to f- work out in my mind how it's going to work exactly i think a lot of those problems are certainly addressable like you could have the drone travel to an approximate gps address and then have your delivery delivery driver as it were then pilot the drone the last you know 500 meters down to the appropriate altitude and then park the package at the door or something of that nature but to address things like you know people throwing rocks at them or shooting them down or stealing packages or all those sorts of things I mean, the obvious solution to that would just be to have countermeasures. So these things just have um, small ordnance that they could fire at people when they detect a threat. (laughs) That's getting into dangerous territory, but I like it. Well, I mean, that that to me is the obvious solution. I would be finding out what sort of of calibre bullet you could get attached to these things and how many rounds you can get per drone. But that may be me overreacting slightly. The alternative would be that perhaps we as a species, if we want to live in all these awesome futuristic 
futures that we envision in the movies and stuff like that, perhaps we just need to stop being assholes. Yeah, I think I think that's a valid point. If people want the future, then just let the future happen. Like change is scary, yes, but not change for the sake of change, change for the betterment of all mankind. And that's right. And it's like if we if we wanted these cool drone things flying around making our lives easier so we don't have to worry about the bloody package not being delivered on time and all that, don't freaking throw rocks at them when you see them and stuff like that. We we look at futures where there's going to be flying cars and stuff like that and we, we will probably have an episode in the future where, where we discuss the future. I just realised the irony in that statement mm-hmm. anyway. Um, but, you know, we talk about wanting to have these flying cars and all that sort of stuff and it's, I know people who can't drive in two dimensions and, and it's scary to see those people out there like this. And I, I've literally just come home from work through God's worst traffic and... You know, we want flying cars, and it's like, people are such assholes, and we can't just seem to get along in any capacity. It's like, I don't see how we can have these visions of the future if we're not willing to accept either less control or more responsibility. And there's sort of a good sort of segue there, I suppose, where um, you're right, absolutely right, put people in traffic and you'll, they'll show you who they really are, but that'll sort of bring us nicely into, like, the... Google's self-driving car, as we've seen, where, you know, the, the test videos where they had a blind person jump in the car and it drove them around and they said, hey, let's go get a taco. And, like, they just it found the nearest Mexican place and took them through the drive through And now that probably was all staged and stuff. But it's been more recently in the news where they've improved the cameras and things and the collision detection and it can see cyclists on the side of the road and whatnot and move out of the way appropriately. If they get that down pat on a 2D environment like our modern roads, like who's to say that flying cars can't be a thing and they're just not piloted by a person? That's true, and I, th- I think it's really impressive technology, and I, I have I, I have all the scepticism because I'm a developer, and I know at, at, the, at the bottom level that there are people writing code for this, and not every line of code is written, you know, first thing in the morning where you're at your best and brightest. Some pieces of code are written at 10 to 5 when you just want to get out the door, so I have a little bit of concern for this not potentially being the greatest thing ever and having some bugs to work out, but I think that's something we need to go through if we want to live in the future. Yeah. Ab- and sorry, go on. I was say, yeah, absolutely. And you're right. Shut up. This is my time. Oh God, damn it. <laughs> sorry. Uh, <laughs> uh, you're right. In that it, there is some potential issues with the code and there's like zero to like very little to no legislation around self-driving cars. And it's something that all governments everywhere in like modern worlds in Western worlds are going to have to learn to deal with sooner rather than later. Like there's got the new Tesla model coming out, which is like completely electric and runs like a freaking dream. And it's like expensive, but that should be the way the cars are going because fossil fuels fuels are, you know, bad, yo, and they're not the way of the future. And, they need to work out how to deal with electric cars and get better ways to charge them and deal with self-driving cars and how to regulate it and make it safer and then move on to, you know, back to the future, flying cars. Yeah, well, I think I think self-driving cars, despite what I said earlier, do have a future. I mean, it's a technology that exists here and now and for better or worse, it does work here and now. Like uh, the, the video you are describing before, I'm sure is scripted to a point but i mean we have some technology in cars now where we have assistance for parallel parking and things like that and that sort of technology seems to work fairly well and i'm sure it it has its fault faults and it's being improved upon all the time but i think the the self-driving car phenomenon if it continues and gets better and better without trying to speculate too much is is something that has potentially bigger impacts than just safety. I mean, I I envision um, perhaps... I I think it's something where we would have to go all one way or all the other. We'd all have to agree to self-driving cars or we would all just have to ban them. I don't think any hybrid solution is going to be great because people, myself included, are morons. So, but I, I think it, it's a time saver. I know, you know, my daily commute to work can be upwards of an hour or so. I could spend that time doing something else if somebody else was driving the car, i.e., you know, Google. 
Yeah, that's a fair point. And like, I see what you're saying about it has to go one way or the other, but that also presents problems just like off the top of my head. Like you'd have to have the option to do manual driving in my mind and all the self-driving cars we've seen so far don't appear to have the option for manual because what if you want to go like on a trip and you have to go like on a dirt road or something or what if there's an accident you have to drive around and it hasn't had time to sync that data from their server or something and uh yeah like if you, your wife's giving birth and it's trying to do 60 along the road and you just want to like zoom up to the hospital or whatever it is i, I take your point there but i i would want to see a system that's robust enough to understand these factors and reroute accordingly so for instance if you were to call a self-driving ambulance car to get your wife to the hospital then it would automatically be allowed higher priority and other cars would be out of the way and it could travel at a higher maximum speed but i think you've got a fair point in terms of manual control i mean you we don't want to erase the skill of driving completely from humanity over the the coming generations or anything like that so, I mean, perhaps there, there needs to be an option, but it needs to be legislated in such a way that you're not doing it on, you know, what would become mega highways or things like that. And it, it would only be allowed out in potentially rural areas or something like that. Yeah, it's a few fair points you bring there. Like maybe they do build roads that are like, like you got tollways already. Why don't you make like a self-driving car only road where normal manual drivers can't go on there? And as you said, like with the ambulance as an example, if it'll say to the system, hey, there's this ambulance going from A to B back to the hospital and all self-driving cars between here and there will automatically move out of the way to give it give away whereas some people these days still take for freaking ever to get out of the way of police cars and ambulances and um it's it's interesting what uh, one way i think that they could sort of in a way force people onto self-driving cars is insurance like if you're driving a completely manual car and you have an accident with a self-driving car that was self-driving then it pretty much automatically puts you at fault and it'll cost you a freaking fortune to replace a self-driving car so that'll eventually just push people out of the market it'll be cheaper to have a self-driving car with very low insurance premiums as opposed to having a manual one with massive premiums well it's true i mean essentially the company creating the car would have to accept responsibility if two self-driving cars were to collide or if they were competing companies then they would have to duke it out with it with each other but i think there'd definitely be financial incentives as well as time saving incentives and I mean, eventually, if you could change a whole city, I'm going to pick Chicago because Watch Dogs, CTOS, game's awesome, you should play it. Um, if, if you had a digital city where pretty much the entire CBD was run by self-driving cars, I, I just, I see within our lifetimes in the next 10 or 15 years, a service where you can ring up essentially a taxi, a self-driving car comes out to your place and perhaps you tell it how many occupants so it just sends out a little single occupant one that just takes up half the size of a normal lane so you can fit twice as many cars in a regular lane and takes you to your destination and because all the cars are aware of all the other cars traffic can move efficiently instead of morons trying to merge and not getting into lanes and you know traffic yeah and if they go on with this electric car thing with it then it'll make like fuel non-existent so that sort of service um, not counting the cost of actually the vehicle itself, but like it'll be cheaper in theory than a taxi because they don't have to pay for fuel and don't have to pay someone's wage to drive the car. Definitely, there's there's certainly a lot of incentives. I'm just thinking while we're discussing Google, mm. Google don't be evil. Um, you've heard of Google Glass, right? Uh, yeah, I think I've heard of it once or twice. Yeah, yeah. I was I was pretty prepared to just end this entire cast right now if you said what the hell is google glass it's just gonna be like you know what this relationship is over i don't even know you that's all right you always know me baby oh god i feel dirty calling you baby (laughs) now it's recorded you can never take it back it's in ink on the internet excellent move me along google glass it's a thing right it is a thing so for those people who don't know it, seriously, stop the podcast, delete the file. I don't know why you're still listening. Yeah, this is your last chance now. All people who want to hear this tech stuff, stay around. Everyone else is like, what are you talking about? I We appreciate your support, but there's the door. Yeah, that's right. Go, go, on, go on to YouTube and, and watch all the videos we're going to have up on there because then you can, you can see the pretty lights where you don't know what we're talking about. <laughs> okay, we're sort of alienating some potential viewers and listeners. That's right true. Now, so let's not do that. No, everyone is welcome. Listen, it, this is a place where you can learn about tech. As we were saying, Google Glass.
That's right. Anyone still listening, we still love you. We love all the guys that left. If you can get in touch with them and let them know that we're sorry, that'd be great. Yes. However, Thank you. Google Glass, the glasses, put in your face, augmented reality. It's 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 a real thing. It's for sale. It's it's kind of a little bit sexy, I have to say. Sexy? Uh, I think the concept not, is not, sexy. Not in, yeah, well, not not in terms of attractiveness. Having this, this stupid glass thing attached to your freaking face is, is pretty unattractive. Yeah. But the, the concept of augmented reality, I find sexually arousing. That's, while well, slightly disturbing, is probably accurate. Superb. We are in agreement. <laughs> this topic is over. No, I I think it's it's got some really good implications, and and once again, it's it's a case of people need to not be jerks with this technology. We know it's going to happen. We know we can't stop it and all that. But this is something where we can have the future. We can have something that was envisioned in those cool movies, and we can have it today. Don't try and use it to spy on people or, or make funny recordings or things like that. Let's just have augmented reality where I can be walking around and Google Glass can be like, hey, there's a taco joint around the corner. You feel like tacos, right? Because you were Googling them last night. And I can be like, Google, get the hell out of my life. I don't want a taco right now. And then you'll cave in and go get a taco. Then I, yes, will be eating a taco five minutes later because damn you, Google, for knowing me so well. But I, I think this has amazing implications and they're escaping me right now because i'm i'm pretty special level of retard at this hour of the evening but just just what you can do having this thing on your face and if if we can get it to the point where it really interacts with real life objects like if you if you sit down at your desk and you can literally just use this augmented reality to pull up all your files on any flat surface on a wall or something like that i think it can change portable computing well, one of the biggest things that I envision it to do is it, to have a proper eye covering HUD and not just like the little thing up in the corner and it'll interact with Google Maps and Google Street View and you can tell it where you want to go and it'll actually have like a line appear in reality, in the augmented reality and tell you where to go and tell you how long it'll take you to get there and say, if you continue at this pace, it'll take you 12 minutes. If um, We found a shortcut because there's lots of foot traffic over here. If you shove that guy out of the way, you'll be able to walk faster and get there in one less minute. That's right. Just a lot of people, a lot of accidents in cars these days are caused by people like being distracted by using their phone or using looking at their GPS or whatever. If it was all contained already within their field of vision in an augmented reality, like that, that risk of those accidents is greatly reduced. Yeah, I definitely think a personal HUD would help with things like this. Do, do you reckon though that it risks? And, and I'm, I'm going to eventually spring a new topic from this, but I'm, I'm going to bring it up slowly because we've still got some time left. D- do you think it risks making people more distracted, though, having having this thing on their face all the time, even though it's augmenting reality, so they're not necessarily cooped up in a, in a little screen that has nothing to do with reality? Do you still think it's going to be a little bit too distracting? Well, it depends on the task, I think. I think it could be distracting socially, um, I mean, it'll, it, there are you could there are ugh, words. There's you could argue that it'll help you like get together with friends more often because you can actually see um, on an overlay where your friends are, where they've checked in last, and just go meet up with people. Or it'll help you get around to events easier to catch up with your friends. But distraction, ugh, it, it's hard to say. I. It, yeah, it'll really depend on the intrusion level of the overlay in this hypothetical HUD, uh, but I don't think it can be any more distracting than what devices already are. I'm glad you said that, because this is the tangent I want to bring up, and we didn't discuss this, and I want your opinions anyway. What's your take on people being essentially less socially connected, because any time they go out to dinner together or any time we're out at a club or something like that, a lot of us are, are looking at our phones, checking Facebook or, or just surfing the net or sending a text message or things like that. It, do, you, do you think, or do you, I don't have any friends, so I don't know, do you find that to be a problem where you think you're potentially being ignored by someone who might be on Facebook or texting while you're talking to them or while they're talking to you? Generally, I find... Um... I do it myself sometimes, but I try not to if I'm like in a social situation with my vast, large circle of many friends. 
like I find that my a few of my friends will get on their phones usually if they're not directly involved in a conversation and they'll only do it for a few minutes and then jump off usually oh excuse me usually they're just getting in touch with people who they want to come out or who are on their way there or things of that nature like if if someone if I was just sitting down to dinner with someone and they whipped out their phone well when there was a lull in the conversation I'd be like well this was a lull eating goodbye like I think we're there to communicate with each other and not to communicate with the people who aren't there that was the purpose of it but if you in a large group of say 10 people and there's like two or three conversations going on and you're not directly involved in one uh, there's no harm whipping out the phone and like jumping on Facebook and saying, "Hey, who else is coming to the pub for a beer?" or texting your friend and saying, "How far away are you?" sort of thing. I, that small distraction, I think, is there's more connectivity between people, but there are certainly situations, and not really in my experience, but I know it does happen with other friends and other groups of people where their lives are lived from their phone or from their laptop. And I think that level is too much. It's certainly a, a pretty apt description of it. My experience being socially spastic is that I, I'm, I'm a real hypocrite. Like when someone will do it to me, if I'm sitting down there to dinner and they pull out their phone and start doing something, especially while I'm saying something that I consider to be important, I'll be like, you son of a bitch. Listen to what the hell I'm saying. Get off your friggin' phone. But I'll find myself doing it a bit, and I don't know whether it's just because people in general tend to bore me, or whether I feel I'm superior enough to multitask and listen to whatever tedious thing they're saying whilst, you know, messaging. I don't have Facebook, so I don't really have a lot of excuses to, to pull this sort of crap on people. But at the same time, it being not very socially able... <laughs> if you if you're thinking suicidal thoughts, call Lifeline on whatever the phone number is. If if you're not terribly socially able, then I I think in some ways, or or if you're introverted, let's let's use introvert. Yeah, that's, because, that's the PC you know, term, right? There are, yeah, there are there are special small little group of people who can't talk to others like me. I know your pain, but if if you're that sort of person, I think it can help be. A little bit of a recharge like if if you're an introvert and you're out with a group of people it consumes a lot of your energy to interact with those people and be a part of the conversation and be vibrant and funny and not just a tedious chore and i think those people having their phone where they can escape into their own little space to recharge their energy a little bit potentially helps those people become more socially active i know it certainly helps me a little bit if i'm out with a group of people that i don't particularly know i.e your friends and if I'm feeling socially overwhelmed, I can look at my phone for five minutes and do my own little thing. And that helps recharge the sense where you can re-enter a conversation and be, you know, ha have more social ability because you've had those few moments to recharge. So I think on that level, it can help people connect more socially. But I think more generally, it's a lot of just people sitting down to dinner and Instagramming photos of what the hell they're eating and just generally ignoring each other via technology. Yeah, I think the the foodstagramming and the selfie phase is annoying, and I think it should pass and die. But you make a very, very valid point about introverts and extroverts, actually. A lot of my very extroverted friends very rarely go onto their phones in conversation, except to, like, if they're talking about something and they want to, like, Google whatever they're talking about to confirm a point. But it's a very, very valid point about how introvert people can as you said, recharge their batteries and then come back into the conversation once they've sort of gone into their own little introverted world for a moment just to back away out of the situation which they don't normally like or don't normally go into. And, hey, if they even, not like you because you don't have Facebook, but if they're checking their Facebook, for example, and they see an interesting news article that one of their three friends linked, then they could have something new to say. Yeah, true. It's it's definitely can be a social aid for people who aren't, coping particularly well with their with their current social situation um you raised an interesting point there which i've completely spaced out on i was checking my phone because you're being tedious yeah i figured that was the case <laughs> but I, I don't mind so much i do it pisses me off the, this selfie face thing like i i'm just i can't believe people are pulling the selfie crap and all that but i I think you, you've just mentioned something good there in the sense that it, it probably will pass. I mean, every generation 
had their own thing and I think this will move on and, you know, the next generation may have something even more outlandish or retarded, but I, I'm, I'm not sure. Wait, how long has this been going on for now? Is this, is this like some 10-year fad or something? Yeah, it seems that way. So, yeah, I, I don't think that's probably necessarily a problem. I think the the food's degrading. I, I just don't understand that whatsoever. And what was the other point you raised? Oh, no, I stopped listening when you started talking. Oh, I see. It's going to be like this, isn't it? It's always like this. Why do you hurt me like this? <laughs> I, will, I will mention one, one more company. Microsoft seemed to be buying up a few things here and there as well, but seem to be floundering a little bit. I mean, that they haven't pulled away with any of their new technologies. Do you have the opinion that if they were to buy a few more startups and just consume them like Google does, that they would potentially be a little more popular or, or be a little bit more, I don't know, trendy in as seen by consumers? It would really depend on what they purchased. Like, you've got Google buying up, like, robotics companies who are making, like, those freaky running cheetah robots and robots that can, like, walk up hills and carry army supplies and stuff. Oh, terrifying Skynet. But um, Microsoft, like, people use Microsoft products because I suppose they always have, and there's... That's sort of like the main option for a lot of people. Like Windows as an operating system is one of the biggest things out there. And there's a lot of people don't like or don't or aren't aware or don't want to use the alternatives. So like I think Microsoft are always going to be around, but become, to become more relevant, they really need to get into the public eye and, as you said, get more trendy and buy up some companies or some startups that just give them a new edge, give them something new to put their previous success into yeah you know, screw microsoft i remembered what point you brought up that i thought was really interesting that i was stalling for time to try and remember um don't let me forget it even though i'm not going to tell you what it is right now uh microsoft you're right uh, and i mean microsoft were putting in a bid last i heard for twitch and it, it seems like they're really trying and i think they're, they're trying to diversify quite a bit but i think the problem is is that microsoft have a significantly larger core market that truly depend on them being the enterprise for operating system and office products that if they end up splitting their attention too much they risk degrading that market whereas i mean google essentially have the whole world depending on them for a search engine but that doesn't necessarily require the same level of focus and updates that potentially an operating system or an office suite does yeah, well, the Google, you just go to your internet and type in google.com and you're there, whereas for Windows and your Office suite, it's a massive installation process and verification and it's a big purchase for people that is just something that's always there when you use your computer. Yeah, that's right. And, I mean, it has to be compatible with billions of different combinations of hardware and things like that. Microsoft have to continually work to keep this right. And if they take one engineer away from that project to work on, you know, Microsoft Tube or, or whatever their, their setup might be to try and kick the ass out of YouTube or something like that, then their core business begins to suffer. And I think, you know, we start to see that a little bit with Windows 8.1 perhaps or Windows 8 or whatever it was with the this start screen shenanigan where perhaps they diversified too much. They're trying to focus a lot more on the on the tablet market and they tried to blend things together. And it didn't really work out the way they hoped because they they just seemed to lose a little bit of their focus as they tended to diversify. And I think that's something Microsoft probably just need to improve on. And they could they could be like Google. They could buy crazy Skynet companies and, you know, start turning people into cyborgs and whatnot. Yeah, uh, cyborgs, that's another cool piece of tech which we should probably talk about in a future episode. We totally will. I've actually gotten into this thing now. I was, I was, for the record, I was totally against discussing speculative future crap when we were talking about this episode uh, earlier. And now, as we've been discussing, I'm like, you know what? This is kind of cool, and I'm totally nerdgasming a bit. So, like, <laughs> leave us a comment somewhere if this is something you want to hear, because I'm, I'm still just slightly undecided. So, I don't know. Say something on Facebook or on Twitter, and let us know if you want to hear us speculate about the cool future that could be. 
just just maybe you can tip me over the edge or make maybe you can prove that just non-lethal needs to keep his opinions to himself and piss off i think if people comment on the video or on the twitters or whatever saying you know we should speculate about the singularity and the future of cybernetics and ai and all that sort of stuff if you geek out about that kind of stuff like i do convince tolly and we'll do it Yes, or you could take my side and you could be like down with non-lethal and we could turn it into some sort of hashtag and, you know, do that social thing that people do that I don't really understand. But anyway, we won't go into that. I'm going to go back to that point that I thought of before. You mentioned how some people will look at their phones to, to Google something and to, to, to make a point or to prove that they were right. Do you remember, being as old as you are, a time when we didn't have access to the entirety of human knowledge in the palm of our hands and you literally have to fight about something for an hour trying to prove that you were right because you couldn't just simply look it up on wikipedia i recall a time it may have been possible i think that was a golden age of social communication because i remember being in school and you just argue about you know what stat some pokemon had or something you'd argue for an hour and then you'd realize after all that time you'd be like you know what who the hell cares let's do something else and nowadays people look it up to prove it it's just like why i mean it does sort of stop a lot of arguments i suppose in that sense like people still argue until it's proven and instead of the old days where you just argued back and forth for hours and no one could be absolutely proven right uh, these days, people can be proven right with a quick Google search. All right, I'm going to extend that topic just a little bit more in, in the few minutes we've got left of this show because, you know, this is no longer a half-hour thing because that's how we roll. If you don't like it, let us know. Comments, Twitter, social media, whatever. Um, what do you think about the fact that we do have access to all of human knowledge essentially in the palm of our hands and we mostly use it for facebook and watching fail blog videos on youtube and things like that well i think that it's moved away from knowledge sharing what it potentially wasn't in the past and in the beginning and it's moved into this social thing of the internet but like i'm I'm like a sponge for knowledge. I, I'm addicted to learning new things. And when I get my mind set on a topic, I just like jump on like Wikipedia or whatever other page and I just read the living Christ out of it. Um, so in that sense, I love having all of the world's knowledge at the part of my hand because if there's something I want to know, I can look it up very easily. But in that other sense, it sort of makes it too easy. Like back when I was at school, you didn't have the internet to like look up and reference things and whatnot yet to like look up in books and read about it and actually learn the the how and the why instead of just the end result and that is what i think they're taking out of schools where they're giving access to the internet and that's what i think is ruining a part of the reason why it's ruining kids and students these days is they just have the answers instead of finding out the, the method I think that's a that's a good point you've raised there and something I hadn't considered is that nowadays we are just jumping to the end result and, you know, we don't get to, or kids these days, you know, whippersnappers, don't get the experience of searching for information and the information you can stumble across whilst trying to find out what you know. I mean, I know we have, you can blunder around Wikipedia for an hour, you can start looking up World War Two, and then you know, suddenly be reading about... Kevin Bacon? Yes, <laughs> because Hitler's Bacon number is probably 20 or something like that. If you don't know what it is, just Google it. Yeah. See what I did there? Mm. Just Google it, yeah. Anyway, I think a, a, an interesting point and something I, I'm going to round out my contribution to this topic on is we've spent a little bit of time discussing the future and all this cool technology that we both have and want to see like self-driving cars and augmented reality and Google Glass and the ability to, you know, have flying death drones that shoot at people that throw rocks at them and stuff like that. But the most amazing piece of technology that we have right now that I think we overlook and and Mitchell sort of brought me to this realisation that we as gamers and internet users tend to overlook the little things is that if you want to know anything, If you want to know anything at all and any human anywhere has ever discovered it, you can find that out. It's there on Google. It's there on the internet. If you're like, you know what? I wonder how a nuclear reactor works and I wonder how I can build a miniature one at home. I swear to God, 
there is something out there on Google about it. You can find out this piece of information. doesn't matter if you're at 10 or 102, you have access to this information that otherwise, you know, could have taken you months to track down and find the right books at libraries and things like that to find out this information. But nowadays, you can just type into Google how a nuclear reactor does worky much goodly, and then it'll auto-correct it to a question that's not stupid, and you can have that information. Yeah, it's it's a bit terrifying in that sense, and like it sort of brings me back to my previous point where people can find out whatever answers and knowledge they want. And the the danger is that I'm concerned about is uh, is having that knowledge on there just leads people to an, an end result, as I mentioned before. Like if you've got a, a kid at school and they're in science class and they need to find out. Um, do boiled eggs spin or not? They can just type that in and it'll just say yes or no, and they don't even bother finding out how or why. That's a that's a really fair point, and I, I think it does take away a little bit of experimentation from kids, both for better and worse. I mean, we all need to learn from our mistakes, and, you know, perhaps kids would have, you know, done these experiments in science class, but now instead they'll just have a class in how to Google the answer so you don't end up blowing up eggs and, and, you know, killing people with flaming pieces of eggshell and whatnot. So it's, it's a bit of an interesting trade-off, and I suppose it's it's something that happens with every generation. They they lose a little bit of the past and gain a little bit of the future, I suppose. That's a very poetic way of putting it, Tully. Yes, that's right. I know things, you bastard. <laughs> you whippersnapper. Yes. One day we, we will... Uh, get into the age difference and I'm sure I'll, I'll find a way to make more of a thing of it and try and, you know, lead you to misery over your age. Every year we get older, the percentage age difference between us gets smaller. Wow, you just used math to bird me. I did. You son of a bitch. <laughs> <laughs> it's like cold water to burn. All right, I think that's where we'll wrap up today's show. It's been a little bit of fun talking about some tech. We'll, uh... Maybe go back to a bit of gaming next week. We're not sure if you'd like to suggest a topic for us to discuss or you want to hear our uneducated opinions on different odds and ends, whether they be gaming, tech, or perhaps otherwise. You know, we don't limit ourselves here. We're a, we're a friendly community of, of nerds that uh, can discuss anything because, you know, we're cool like that. Yeah, we cater to all types of nerd, whether you're internet, gaming, literary, uh drama nerds whatever it may be we're happy to talk about it because we are open to suggestions and open to discussion that's exactly right so if you haven't already subscribe to us on itunes i'm still adding us to other podcast directories as i do i'll probably get non-lethal to put them up on twitter because if i touch it it burns my skin speaking of which you can follow us on the twitter at nerds at night and also follow us on Facebook at slash Nerds at Night Community. And we also have our YouTube channel, slash Nerds at Night Gaming, which if you keep an eye on, we have a surprise coming up there, hopefully soon. Yes, we had fun doing that the other day. We're not going to tell you what, but it will be on there eventually. Look, we've been talking about it for the last couple of weeks. People know we've done it. People, people suspect we have the competence to do it. So the mystery is is whether we actually manage to pull it off. That's a valid point. Watch this space and you'll find out. That's right. Until then, I've been Tolly. And I'm non-lethal. Thanks for listening.